We're now going to take a closer look at how we can find our real axis breakaway and break in points. In order to do that, we're going to consider a root locus for a unity feedback system, which has a forward gain of g of s equals k times the quantity of s minus 3 times the quantity of s minus 5 divided by the quantity of s minus 1 times the quantity of s plus 2. And so because this is a unity feedback system, of course, we have our h of s equal to 1. So then our open loop transfer function, g of s times h of s, is just equal to g of s in this case. So we can basically look at this as we're determining our open loop zeros and our open loop poles. Excuse me. So the first thing that we want to do is we're going to sketch our root locus. And so we're going to get a little more practice using those rules and sketching that before we actually move on to talking about our breakaway and break in points. So if we're looking at that close or sorry, that open loop transfer function g of s up there, we can see that we're going to have two zeros and two poles. So the zeros we can see are coming from this information here. So we're going to have one zero at s equals three. So we can put that right here. And so our zeros again, we're representing with open circles. And our second zero is going to be at s equals five. So that's going to be right there. Now we have two poles as well. So from that information in our denominator, we see we have a pole at negative one. Sorry, and our poles are of course going to be x's. And we have a pole at negative two. So we get something that looks like this. So with that information, we're now ready to move on to actually plotting our root locus. So we want to keep in mind those five rules. And in this case, we see that we have two finite zeros and two finite poles. So we don't have any infinite zeros or poles. So because of that, we can essentially just ignore our rule five. We're not going to need any asymptotes. So let's sort of go through the remaining rules. So our rule one says that the root locus has to be symmetrical about our real axis. So we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, for rule two, we know that each, each pole in our closed loop system is going to correspond to a branch on our root locus. So in this case, we would have two uh, closed loop poles. And so we don't have that closed loop transfer function written explicitly, but you can kind of take my word for it, or you can sort of reduce that that feedback system and find that explicitly. But we have two closed loop poles, so we're gonna have two branches to our loop root locus. And so that kind of makes sense if we go on to think about our fourth rule. So I'm intentionally skip three here for a second. So our fourth rule says we're going to start at our poles, so infinite and finite um, open loop poles, and we're going to end at our infinite and finite open loop zeros. So basically, we're going to be starting at these poles over here, and we're going to be ending at these zeros over here. So now, coming back to our third rule, so that's relevant to where our root locus is on the real axis. And so it says that we're on the real axis if we're to the left of an odd number of open loop finite zeros and or poles. So what we do is we're gonna start over here on the right side, and we're gonna work our way from right to left and figure out what regions were on the real axis. So of course in this first region here, we're to the left of zero open loop poles or zeros. So what that means is we're not on the real axis. In this region, we're to the left of one uh, open loop zero. So this guy here. So in that region, we are going to be on the real axis with our root locus. As soon as we get past that second zero, uh, we're no longer to the left of an odd number, now we're to the left of two open loop zeros. And between our two poles though, we're going to be to the left of three open loop poles or zeros. So we have one pole and two zeros, so we're on the real axis there. But as soon as we go beyond that other pole, we're now to the left of four open loop poles, uh, finite open loop poles and or zeros. So we're no longer on the real axis, okay. So we have the two regions where we're on the real axis. So how do we get from here to here? Because we know we're starting at the poles on the left, ending at the zeros on the right. Well, we're going to be breaking away. Of course, that should be expected. We're looking at breakaway and break in points. And so we keep in mind that we have a, uh, we need to have symmetry about our real axis and um, we're gonna have two paths. 
So one of our paths is going to be coming up here. And so doing something like this. And so doing my best to make that symmetrical about the real axis, we have something that looks like this on the other side. And now the direction of our root locus is going to be going from these poles towards this breakaway point. So here's our breakaway point. And then it's going to be moving along in this direction. And then once it reaches this break in point, which is over here, it's going to be moving in towards, or, or rather outwards, one here towards this zero and one towards this zero. And so of course the movement along that corresponds to changes in this gain value K. So now we've successfully sketched this root locus, we can go ahead and label a couple values for those breakaway and break in points. So let's call this point here our sigma one. So that's going to be our breakaway point. And let's call this point our sigma two, and that's going to be our break in point. So let me go ahead and write that as well. So this is break in, and this one over here is break away. And so I might not have drawn this perfectly well, but what we should see, <clears throat> excuse me, is that for when we have two of these paths leaving the real axis or coming into the real axis, they should leave or come in at a 90 degree angle. Okay, so let's now talk about how we can find values of our sigma one and sigma two. So one values of our sigma one and sigma two. So again, keeping in mind that the blue arrows are showing the directions, let's talk about our breakaway point first. So our breakaway point so we know it's occurring between negative one and negative two, just because those are our two pole locations. So it occurs between negative one and negative two. So now in that region, it's going to occur for maximum gain. So in that region, so it occurs for max gain. And so, of course, that just comes from that direction that our root locus path is taking. It's starting at those green X's. It's moving towards that red dot of sigma one. And so at a maximum gain value, it's at sigma one. And if we increase gain more, it's now breaking away and it's moving along these paths here. So you can kind of see where we're going with this in a little bit. We're going to be talking about maxes and min. So, of course, we can take derivatives and set things equal to zero. But we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves a little bit there. Uh, so let's talk about as well that break in point. Okay, so our break in point is occurring between our two zeros. So that is going to occur between our three and five. So it occurs between three and five. And so in this case, in that particular region, it's going to be occurring for a minimum gain. So that region so it occurs for a minimum gain. So depending on whether we have break away or break in, we're looking at either min or max. So what we're gonna talk about here is just the first method. So we're gonna ultimately talk about two different methods that we can solve for, again, that specific break away or that specific break in point. Um, the first one we're going to talk about here, and as I kind of alluded to, what we're going to do is differentiate a gain equation. So differentiate an equation for the gain. And then once we do that, of course, we want to set it equal to zero. So we're using our fundamentals of calculus here. And so once we do that, we can solve for local maxes and mins. <coughs> Excuse me. So we need to put this together with some other information we know about our root locus. So for a point to be on a root locus, remember we need some criteria to be met. So for a point to be on our root locus, we have to have that k times g of s, h of s is equal to one, or sorry, negative one. 
And so what we can do is then, of course, we can rearrange that and say that means that k has to be equal to negative 1 over g of s times h of s. But we need to keep in mind that we're talking about sigma 1 and sigma 2, which are on the real axis. So because we're on the real axis, that means we have no imaginary part. And if we have no imaginary part, our s, which equals um, sigma plus j omega, can just be reduced to our sigma term. So we don't have any j omega, so our s is just sigma. So instead, what we're going to be evaluating is our k is equal to negative 1 over g of sigma times h of sigma. So we're just going to take our g and our h equations. We're going to plug in sigma instead of x. We differentiate that equation with respect to sigma, set it equal to 0, solve for sigma, and that's going to give us our local maxes and mins. So what we're going to do in the next video is we're going to take a closer look at how we can use that method on this particular root locus. And then in the following video, we're going to look at a second method that does not require the use of calculus.